Welcome back to One Piece Explained. While the second season of the One Piece live action is getting ready for production, I wanted to revisit the first season to see if there were any more easter eggs that we could find, and I'm glad I did, because there were a ton of really cool details that I overlooked in my initial breakdowns. Which by the way, if you're new to the channel or haven't seen those videos before, I highly recommend checking them out before continuing this one, as I won't really be reiterating the easter eggs and details that I found the first time through. If you're interested, there will be a link on screen and in the description. If you enjoyed any of those videos or my live action content in general, I'd really appreciate it if you'd liked and subscribed. Not only does it help to support me and grow the channel, but you'll also be able to get my live action videos as soon as they come out. Also, brief spoiler warning, as in this breakdown, we'll be talking about some references here that go beyond the scope of the material covered in season one. Nothing too deep or story breaking, but be warned if you don't want any detail ruined in your experience of the story. So with that said, on to the re-breakdown. Starting things off with the map in the intro sequence, we can actually make out a ton of new details along the Grand Line using this map and the full map that we see at the end of episode 8. Of course, all the way to the left is a reverse mountain, where the four oceans connect and lead into the paradise half of the Grand Line. Over here is what looks like could be Alabasta, with the Sandoro River running through its center. This would mean the islands before it would need to include Cactus Island, where Whiskey Peak is located, Little Garden, and Drum Island. The island over here somewhat matches the shape of Little Garden, meaning Drum Island would be somewhere further along, though it's hard to really say which one of these little scraps of land that could be, and it's a similar case for Cactus Island going in the other direction. However, there is one surprise here in that this cluster of star-shaped islands actually looks to be the Boyne Archipelago where Usopp spent time training. There's a better look of it in the intro sequence here. Moving a bit further down the Grand Line, you can spot what looks to be the island of Jaya. It was a bit hidden in the intro sequence behind the R, and further down is actually Skypea, with the crescent shape and the little extended section to the bottom right. Going even further above is a circular island with 10 pronounced parts along the perimeter. This is likely a long ring long land given its shape. Now, this is where things get a little tricky. Water 7 is a bit hard to place among the rest of these islands. It could be one of these two given that they both have a section that is sort of detached from the rest that could represent the rocky cape where the Straw Hats docked. That part actually more closely resembles the first island, whereas the second island is a bit larger and resembles Water 7 with its circular shape. Either way, we can move further down the Grand Line and get this cluster of three islands that could be San Feldo, Pucci, and St. Poplar, three islands that are serviced by the sea train that extends from Water 7. The sea train also connects to Ennius Lobby, which can be seen even further down the Grand Line as identified by its shape. Notice the peculiar geography with the two land masses connected by a strip of land, and then the disconnected piece of land where the Tower of Justice is stationed on the other side of the giant hole. This means a bit further down, you can find a crescent-shaped island where Marine HQ once stood, Marineford. These two islands are each endpoints of the tub current, with the last one being impelled down. However, since it's located on the comm belt and is not an actual island itself, it would not be seen on this map. Though if it were, it would be just under off screen. Similarly, this is why the island of Amazon Lily cannot be found on this map either. The Shabaudi Archipelago was said to be close to Marineford, but it may not be depicted on this map since it's not an actual island, but rather a huge forest growing from the ocean, and as such, has no magnetic pull for a log pose. There are a bunch of other rather sizable islands on the map, but they are a bit too difficult to place exactly. We have a ton of paradise islands that have yet to be counted for, but we don't necessarily have great information on their shape or location, so I won't be trying to guess each of those. If there's any other connections you can make for from this map, I'd love to read about it in the comments. Now, at the very top of the map, you can make out what looks to be sheets of ice. This could represent the arctic areas of the globe and may be giving us a glimpse of the north pole in this world. And one final interesting detail in this full map of the East Blue is this massive island above the Konomi Islands. It's completely unlabeled and has no discernible shape resembling other islands that we know of. This full map actually includes pretty much every named canon island in the East Blue, even Koja, an island we only learned of relatively recently in the series. One guess I have is that this may be the Kingdom of Fraus, ruled by Queen Bande de Zene. Also, given its location as one of, if not the northernmost islands on the map, and its French-inspired name, this may be the island where Mikio is located a country in the north that produces wine that we first saw during the Bratier arc and also referenced in this adaptation. Of course, there are a bunch of other locations on the maps that we see across the series that I covered in my initial breakdowns, so be sure to check those out if you're interested. Now on to episode 1. At the very start of the series, Garp asks Roger for his last words. Do you have any last words? Yeah. You take these off. Starting to itch. This is a bit of a nod to Luffy when he was also complaining about an itch on the execution platform. 
When we meet Alvida, you'll notice one of her crewmates holding up a mirror for her, and you can see a few other mirrors throughout the ship as well. In my initial breakdown, I pointed out how this could be seen as an adaptation of her obsession with beauty from the manga, but it can also be seen as a tongue-in-cheek nod to the Volume 6 SPS question, where Oda joked that she probably didn't have any mirrors on her ship. When Kobe notices a noise on the ship, off to the side there are a couple of barrels reading quackers, foul play. It's hard to pin the exact reference going on here, but considering the name of Alvida's ship is the Miss Love Duck, this could be seen as a duck-themed pun. And I think this may be the case, given that we later see a barrel in the back reading canard, which is French for duck, but in English, canard can also mean a groundless story or rumor, which is exactly what Kobe and Luffy are discussing in this scene with the Legend of the One Piece. Now moving over to Sixus Island, I initially missed the various rock formations that you can briefly spot when we cut over just before the camera pans down to the shrine area. They're a little difficult to make out in totality, unless you adjust the brightness and contrast of the shot. In the Aces Story manga adaptation, the island featured one huge mountain at the center, whereas here we see a bunch of smaller rock formations, though you can still see a mountain-like structure that is much larger than the rest in the back. The candles that Zoro lights are on top of a statue of an animal that's a bit hard to make out. It roughly resembles a Koma Inu, or a lion dog, whose statues you can find guarding various shrines and temples in our real world. We would also later see a Koma Inu during the Wano arc. However, when we get a different angle of the statue, it also somewhat resembles a frog, which could be seen as a nod to Zoro being called a little frog by Mihawk. Soon after the realization that Luffy ate the gum gum fruit, we see Luffy framed with the sun shining behind him in the back. There are quite a lot of these sorts of shots throughout the series, emphasizing the importance of the sun with respect to Luffy. In Nami's notebook, we talked about how the page on the right is a nod to the country of Wano, but the location on the left is still a bit of a mystery. It does vaguely resemble some of the structures that we saw in Chandora, but it's hard to be sure. Once again, if you have an idea for what this could be nodding to, I'd love to read about it in the comments. On the bounty wall in Shellstown, there are two bounty posters that still remain a bit of a mystery. This one on the left has a name that ends with ONG. Now in my initial breakdown, I suggested that this could belong to Arlong, given that he's one of the few pirates in the series whose name ends with that specific string of letters. Though I think this is unlikely since Arlong's bounty poster in this series doesn't match the rest of the poster we see here. There's also another bounty poster below Alvida's, featuring someone with a blue complexion seemingly grinning. While this also sounds a lot like Arlong's bounty poster, it doesn't really match. It's hard to say who these characters are supposed to be, and given how obfuscated they are, it makes me wonder if these are characters we've yet to even see in the source material just yet. That would be very interesting. That said, I'd love to read your best guesses at who these are in the comments as well. At the restaurant, Luffy plans how to break into the marine base when he says, I can't get inside the base for the gate. Maybe, maybe, maybe what if I get inside flying? I can grab into a bird or something. Which is almost exactly how he ends up arriving at Orangetown in the source material. Later, Rika offers Zoro chocolate rice balls, and although this scene doesn't play out exactly how it does in the manga, we do get a bit more to play of Zoro's kind heart, as he goes on to eat the ruined rice balls despite chocolate being his least favorite food. In my initial breakdown, I pointed out how Old Cactus Whiskey is a reference to Whiskey Peak on Cactus Island, and you can see a barrel of it in the background here. This brand of whiskey is everywhere throughout this series. Over in Helmeppo's room, you can spot a few pairs of headphones which may feel a bit anachronistic to this world in conjunction with the presence of things like the jukebox, but we do see similar technology in the world of One Piece later on in the series as well. On one of the walls, you can spot a ship with the Black Cat Pirates Jolly Roger, the Bezon Black, which really tells you how much false pride Helmeppo has in his father's supposed victory over Kuro, even though that's not the entire truth. Speaking of, when we get a close-up on Morgan's arm during his battle with the Straw Hats, you can actually make out a scar that he received from Kuro during their encounter years ago. And to finish the episode off, we see the lifeboat taken from Alvida's ship is also appropriately themed after a duck. During Luffy's flashback, he's sitting next to crates of what looks to be milk, one of Luffy's favorite beverages. The crew gets knocked out by some sleeping gas deployed by Buggy, and while this never happened in the source material, the Straw Hats do face a very similar situation later on in the series, when they get ambushed with sleeping gas by a different clown-themed character. When Luffy looks out the window, you can briefly see the ship of the Buggy Pirates, the Big Top, just before the shot settles on their Jolly Roger and transitions into the title card. Speaking of Jolly Rogers, the walls of the crate the Straw Hats are trapped in have bits and pieces of different symbols that are a bit hard to make out in totality, but this one here seems to resemble the Creek Pirates Jolly Roger. 
Later on, Luffy calls Buggy Boogie, which was actually his name in an early concept of the character. Now in my initial breakdown, I talked about this wall that featured various members of Buggy's crew from the manga and pointed out exactly where each panel was taken from, but there was one that I for the life of me could not place, until now. This character here looks to be taken from a panel in chapter 10 when the crew smirked at the Straw Hats learning about Buggy's powers. He looks to be the guy in the middle with the fanged hat and sideburns. We can actually see this panel once again with the other two characters featured at the bottom of the wall in another shot. And to close out episode 2, I should mention that while I did point out Kumate Island on the map, I gloss over the fact that it was shaped like a bear claw, which is what Kumate translates to in Japanese. This is also similar to the island's shape as we saw in the anime. Now on episode 3, in my breakdown, I mentioned how we saw Belmare's tangerines were for sale across the East Blue. We can see a few cans of them in the kitchen of Kai's mansion here in episode 3, and can even spot them on the Going Merry later in episode 4. When Luffy and Zoro find Usopp in the kitchen later that night, we see Usopp practicing his marksman skills with some popcorn kernels, which leads Luffy to take an interest in Usopp, and by the end of episode 4, their friendship blooms and Usopp is shown on the ship now eating fully popped popcorn, bringing us full circle. Luffy also mentions how he knows Yasop and how they used to hang out as we saw from the brief flashback during the Surf Village arc, though it's a real shame we didn't get the scene adapted in the live action in some form. In episode 4, we learned about the existence of the East Blue Electric Clock Company. In my breakdown, I talked about how electricity does exist in the world of One Piece, though the level of technology can vary from island to island. That said, more recently in the manga, we did learn that the scientist Vegapunk was responsible for bringing light to places all around the world. In the mansion, there is a painting of a person with ram-like horns. This could very well be of Mary, but it's important to note that horns are just commonplace throughout the world of One Piece. In my breakdown, I mentioned the various ships on the wall of the foyer to the mansion, but on the left side of this shot looks to be a sea train, perhaps the Puffing Tom itself. Kaya's family's fascination with ships makes a lot of sense, given that they own a shipyard in this adaptation, and the inclusion of the sea train here also works given the easter egg involving Tom's execution in episode 3. Moving on to episode 5, we can see one of the kitchen staff wearing a black undershirt with the cook pirates Jolly Roger on it. We see this again later at the end of episode 6, as it seems Zeph has repurposed the symbol for the Bratier in this adaptation. In the dining area, there are still a ton of paintings that are a bit difficult to make out. I talked about a bunch of them in my initial breakdown, but I wonder if we'll ever be able to figure out some of these references, though this one in particular reminds me a bit of Water 7 given the structure. During the scene between Mihawk and Krieg, alongside the defeated Krieg pirates, you can actually make out a more obscure member of the crew, Idea Man. During the conversation between Luffy and Sanji, on the wall of the kitchen you can make out a few culinary awards. These could be seen as a nod to the East Blue Cooking Championship that we saw in the anime during the Logetown arc. And at the bar, Usopp drunkily tells stories about his exploits, much like he did during the Whiskey Peak arc. Funny enough, we recently learned about the Straw Hat's alcohol tolerance and Usopp ranked near the bottom end. And when discussing Zoro's duel with Mihawk, Nami says, Did you see the size of that guy's sword? He will slice you into sashimi. Which, funny enough, is the food that Zoro is best at preparing. In episode 6, Zeph's outfit here is reminiscent of his appearance in the decks of the World Cover Story with his red and white striped shirt. I really gotta get the Wadaichu monkey ready for him. The what? His sword. It's got a name. Oh. Why? A fun bit in Zoro and Sanji's dynamic here is that Sanji thinks it's silly to name swords, while Zoro thinks similarly about naming techniques. After hearing Sanji's backstory with Zeph, Luffy comments. I'd eat both arms and legs to save Sora's life. And we've seen the Straw Hats be willing to give up limbs to save each other throughout the series. At the Bratier, the bottle of wine in front of Chu looks to be DS, the same brand that we saw in the barrels in the cellar of Kai's mansion that Doflamingo drank in the manga. And when the crew is preparing to leave, one of the people walking on the dock of the Baratier is wearing a black and white spotted bucket hat, very reminiscent of the one worn by Bartholomew Kuma. Moving on to episode 7, we get a good look at Sanji's ring, and it bears the cook pirate's Jolly Roger as well, just another token to remember Zeph and the Baratier. At the bar in Arlong Park, amongst the containers on the counter is one that looks like Ankuro, Waratsumi's pet angler fish from the manga. Soon after, we see Chu spit out alcohol into a torch to produce bursts of fire, and this is very reminiscent of Vasco Shot's drunken spitfire technique where he does the same thing with alcohol and a match. And during Nami's flashback, you can see a piece of art in the back with a squid-like painting that reminds me a lot of Ikoro Smooch's best friend, Daedalus. 
and over in episode 8, the map we see here on the table in Nami's flashback is actually of the Gecko Islands where Syrup Village is located. You can tell from its shape relative to the map of the East Blue we've seen across the series. She takes it and places it underneath the map of the Oregon Islands where Orange Town is located, although according to the map of the East Blue, the Gecko Islands should be a little more to the left. When Along Park is crumbling down, you can make out the gate that we saw in the source material all the way to the left. And in my breakdown, I talked about the small easter egg for Alabasta on Zeph's board, but when you look at it closer, it seems to use the spelling Arabasta, which would be the literal pronunciation of it in the Japanese text. Over the years, most fans of the western translations of One Piece have grown accustomed to the Alabasta spelling, so it'll be interesting to see how they go about it in Season 2. Now, across these episodes, we've seen every major member of the Red Hair Pirates adapted in some form, aside from Howling Gab, and that's most likely because Gab was not introduced until much later on in the manga, even being absent in Romance Dawn. And while we eagerly await any news on casting for Season 2, we did recently learn that the stand-in who played Smoker at the end of Season 1 was actually the same actor who played Kurobi, Jean LaRue. And finally, in the full map of the East Blue in the credits, Momu can be spotted once again by the Konomi Islands. And that's about it for all the details and easter eggs that I spotted this time around. If there's anything that you spotted, I'd love to read about it in the comments, and make sure to check out my initial breakdown of each episode for everything I found the first time through. I'm certain there are even more little details tucked away in each and every frame that we'll only come to realize after more and more watchthroughs. If you enjoyed this breakdown, be sure to like and subscribe, it helps to support me and grow the channel, and you'll also be able to get my videos on One Piece Season 2 as soon as the trailers and episodes come out. As always, thank you so much for watching, stay safe, and I hope to see you in the next one.